order. Um, special counsel, would you please uh, call the roll? Yes. Director Barnes. Here. Director Guzman. Here. Director Sloss. Here. Director Showless. Here. Director Howard. Here. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. So we have some um, really terrific uh, presentation and discussion items today. So I'm delighted to introduce the first one. We're going to hear about the smart meter public relations engagement. And um, I'm not sure, are you, are you introducing this? Yeah, I can definitely do okay, that. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Grace to introduce. Good morning, directors. Hope everyone's well. Um, as you all know, there's nothing more important to this utility than providing safe and clean drinking water to our customers. So today we're excited to introduce you to some key members of a leading water communications firm, Katz & Associates. They've been charged with developing an education and outreach program to build awareness and understanding for our customers relative to lead service lines. Our agenda today describes them as a smart meter of public relations, um, but truly their services and expertise are going to encompass every aspect that our utility is doing to prepare for those national lead and copper rule changes. Um, in fact, those changes spurred us to bring on uh, these lead and copper experts to support us and keep us in front of those regulations. Uh, many of these new regulations aren't coming until 2024, but we recognize the opportunity to begin now with the smart metering program. So Katz and Associates are going to work with our smart metering team to ensure that our message is consistent and um, it aligns with the interest of our customers. Um, we have so many stakeholders that are going to be impacted, so we need to make sure we're talking in one voice. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Snyder. She's going to act as our program manager from Katz. We've asked her to present their qualifications and expertise in the area of water-related outreach programs, and then to provide a high-level overview of the recommended approach that they're developing for our lead service line outreach strategy. And as always, we are looking forward to this committee's feedback um, and input as we move forward. Thank you, Grace. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Grace. Um, and thank you for having us here this morning. We're really excited to uh, talk about um, some initial strategies that we're putting together for your lead service line communication. Um, program and most importantly like Grace just said to get your input but if you'll bear with me we'll just take a couple of seconds to um, introduce our, our team and, and then get to at least some high-level recommendations that we've made so far and if technology works for me this will switch but it did not uh -oh. <clears throat> I don't know if somebody else can yeah thank you <laughs> that works perfect for me thank you so much um, as Grace mentioned, my name is Karen Snyder. I'm a vice president with Katz & Associates, um, which is a public outreach and public engagement firm that started um, nearly 37 years ago, uh, specifically to support water infrastructure uh, project in California at that time. And since that time, our focus has remained on um, water, wastewater, stormwater, large infrastructure projects um, around the country at last count, I'm not sure if it's up on this slide, but we um, have worked in 31 states um, on projects of all size, urban and rural environments, um, uh, large, small utilities, and pretty much every scenario you can think of in the water, wastewater, stormwater um, uh, environment, the sorts of things that could come up. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to water, water still today, we're a firm of 40 people. So we're, I guess you would consider a small to mid-sized firm, but our firm, in addition to 50% of our work being in the water sector, um, we also do do some work in transportation and energy. But the more important thing is kind of the, the list of core services that, that you see there. Um, we are a, a full service firm, and whether we have folks working in transportation or water, they bring skill sets that, you know, on large multi-year complicated projects, you never know if those needs are, 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 are going to be there. So it's important to be able to react, react quickly. And, and that's a list of services that, um, that we do provide. Um, we can go to our next slide. Um, I'm really excited to kind of introduce to you the team that we assembled um, for, for this really important work. This is um, a, a big issue, as you well know, lead and service line and just the issue of lead in general. And um, the team that we've assembled um, brings literally decades of experience in either water, wastewater issues, large infrastructure, large agency 
issues. So um, we've, we've tried to assemble the team of national and local experts that can really give a, a full rounded strategy um, to, to what you're working on here. Um, collectively, what this team has learned in all those years of experience is that there is no cookie cutter approach. Every agency is different, every city is different, every stakeholder community is different, and what might look good on paper in a communication plan um, may turn out to have very different needs once you put boots on the ground, which is what you will be doing. So um, we believe this team represents um, all the things we need to be thinking about and looking around the corner as you're, as you're talking about lead service, lead service line um, communication. Um, as the first name implies, uh, well, several people obviously are not here, um, and I'm gonna allow Michelle to uh, introduce herself in a second. She probably needs no introduction, but um, I will turn it over to Michelle. But first, um, Sarah Katz is, uh, as the name might imply, our founder. She is still a very active, engaged uh, CEO, which I, for one, am super grateful about because um, she brings just decades of experience working on exactly these kinds of issues. Um, and also has done it around the United States and, and even globally. So the relationships with other agencies, some of which are going through what you're going through, um, could be very helpful um, and she's available to you. I've had the privilege of working with Sarah for decades. Um, first during my 15 years working for a water and wastewater utility in Pennsylvania, handling all their um, customer, customer and community outreach. And then when I went on the consulting side, and um, at least for myself during that time, I've um, had the fortune of working on large multi-year programs um, that had very comp complicated and complex uh, issues, organizational structures, uh, stakeholders. I'm sure some of that will resonate um, with you all as well. I worked for 12 years in Detroit where we were responsible for helping stand up their public affairs division for that, what was then the Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, as they work to implement um, a very large capital improvement program, mainly focused on aging infrastructure and issues within their system. Um, in the city of Fresno, we worked for five years actually under Jacobs Engineering, who also works with you, um, to fully transition that city from its groundwater supply to its surface water supply, which brought in the host of water quality issues as you change supply and water characteristics. Um, I also created the plan for the city of Los Angeles uh, for their One Water LA uh, plan, which is their plan for water sustainability in California, which involved, um, in, the, in their case, uh, very large neighborhood councils. So preparing people and your team members and consultants to go out and work with those neighborhood councils as you're trying to communicate about a complex topic. So. All that is to say, we've seen some of this and there are lessons that could be applied here, but we certainly understand that, uh, that each area is unique. Um, I've also, uh, we're working with Terry Fairchild. I'm sorry she couldn't be here today, but uh, Terry and I have worked together for decades. In fact, she, Sarah Katz and I um, met when the American Water Works Association first set up a public affairs council uh, back in the 90s to address water communication issues before such a thing was of interest to water utilities. And um, Terry remains a national expert on water communication. Um, she and, and, and I, we were both with utilities as was Brent Eidson um, in the 90s when, um, when we were first dealing with lead and copper, when the very first rule came out. Um, and Terry continues to be our lead for um, utility communications, helping them prepare for um, lead and copper compliance. And what you will find with Terry when you meet her, and I'm sorry she couldn't be here today, is that she really looks at this from the perspective of the people and not the pipeline. Mm -hmm. She is interested in your people, the ones who are out there trying to do the right thing every day and talk about you know complicated issues and provide quality service. And obviously the other people on the pipeline, the daycare workers, the, um, the moms, the families, the small businesses, who really wanna understand what it is that we're talking about and know what they have to do. Um, in addition, we have Brent Eidson. I'll just very quickly say that Brent brings uh, much water and wastewater um, experience. He start before he joined our firm, he started as Deputy Director of External Affairs for City of San Diego, where he saw up close and personal issues associated with 
bad meter reads, high bills. Um, they did do lead service line. They have done smart metering. And Brent in particular understands that while we may internally look at those as separate issues, our customers don't. They're seeing you doing a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and they don't understand how it works together and they don't understand how it relates to their bill. So um, that perspective is gonna be um, very important. And with that, I've probably talked enough. So I'd love to turn it over to Michelle. I will say that we were really fortunate to get to work with Michelle when she was with the Port of San Diego. Um, and we were thrilled to find out that she could join us given her you know, extensive strategic expertise as well as her local knowledge and also her um, experience working with Bill, who's working with us as a, a liaison under his Jacobs um, work. Uh, so to talk about that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, hi everybody. Um, the, uh, one of the things that's really exciting about joining and partnering with CATS on this is the fact that when um, they bring such national expertise, I mean, they, you could really hear 35 years, but it's really grounded in very practical experience in what exactly what you're doing. So when I was asked to join the team, I was thrilled. Um, and um, as some of you know, for the last six years, I was the uh, chief of staff and vice president of external affairs for the Port of New Orleans, working with stakeholders from residents to tenants, industry folks, community leaders, elected officials. And when I joined, um, it, you know, I learned very, very quickly that something that you already know, and that is that more than anything else, and certainly more than any other place I've lived, New Orleans is a city of relationships, and it's a st city of people, and it's a very unique, um, it's a very unique place and wonderful place. And so when, when the challenge that we have here is very similar to the one that we faced at the port, where people didn't understand what we did, they didn't understand who we are, and we really had no allies because if we talked about projects, we didn't have a community of trust. Um, now the Sewage and Water Board has made a lot of strides in that area, but you know it, there's there's always room for improvement. And when you have a project like smart water meters and lead ser um, lead service lines, you're you're going to go right back and stir up that mistrust again. So it's really important and wonderful that you are taking this actually, you know, hugely proactive step and and um, and working at this. And really the the need, the, the port and sewage and water board are very similar in that the industries are complicated. You deal with people, people really need you, but but they don't understand. And so the the lingo is such that you may know what you're talking about, but it can all actually be very limiting when you're talking to the community. And the community, in this case, as always, is both the individual residents and community, as well as the elected officials. And it's really important to be able to talk to everybody it, as they are and as they, as they, um, uh, you know, where, where they are. So the as we look at this project, and I want to get to the scope. Um, but before we do that, the philosophy that has really been helpful at the port, and I think that CATS is really is coming to this project with, is the real need to meet people where they are. Whoever that stakeholder is, we need to meet them where they are. And that means, you know, educating and educating, but from, from their perspective, directly addressing their concerns, hearing and listening to what those are. And then knowing enough about the entirety of the Sewage and Water Board agenda in initiative that we're all talking with one voice and that you know we have to talk we have to have very clear messaging about lead service lines but there are so many other projects that have to be incorporated with the same voice in order to make strides um, one of the things that's really important is to earn respect and buy-in by continuing to show up i mean you talk about lead and water regardless if it's a bad story or a good story it's going to create fear and we just have to keep showing up when people might be agitated or nervous or upset and using all of us from your internal staff to our team bill Russell with bright moments is already working with jacobs which is thrilling because he does know he, he's very deeply he has very deep trusted roots in this community and so for him to really be able to help spread the message is going to be really really important and valuable um, and one of the things that is most important of all is to partner wherever possible and to create allies so that we're not always saying, oh, we're, we're the sewage and water board and here's what we have to say. It's much better to have somebody else be saying, boy, the sewage and water board is doing a great job. And some of the partners that we can just see right now 
automatic easy ones are Genevieve No and the City Department of Public Health is going to be really important to help both internally within the city as well as in the community. Um, she's certainly well known, a well known face since COVID, but even before she's got the credibility even in the medical community that is is um, is going to be helpful. And then your communications plan already references the need to involve the neighborhood engagement office with the city, and I also think that that's going to be a critical critical asset and ally for us as we move forward with this project. Thank you. Um, just quickly beyond this team, I'm sorry, if you could, whoever was saying, changing slides, um, just to let you know within, within Cats and Associates, we have a bench of team members in addition to the ones that I just introduced that um, are at the ready. They work on infrastructure, water and sewerage projects, transportation, energy every day. And so there are those extra minds, arms, legs as you need them for, you know, complicated projects. So um, we just wanted to make, make sh the point that they are available um, to you. And I, I didn't mention it, but I think it's, it's, it bears mentioning that um, while our headquarters is in California, I am located in Freeport, Florida, which is the other side of the bay from Destin, for any of you, you who have been out there. Um, Michelle is in Nashville, um, Terry is in Atlanta. So we, uh, you know, we are basically East Coast based and, and South and able to, to be here um, very quickly for whatever you need when that time arises. Although the virtual world has allowed us to do, do a lot these days. Um, so that's a team with that, if we could turn the slide, um, you know, a, a lot remains to be done. We're at the very earliest stages here, but in talking to your, your team so far, um, we put together our, our heads together and prepared what we saw as kind of a, you know, first 100 days action plan. What are some things that we need to do right out of the chute? You all are already, you know, being proactive about this. What can we do to make sure we're meeting that time schedule and really getting out there in front of things and having a unified game plan to educate and raise awareness and make sure people have the information they need in a way that they can understand it. Um, so again, your input's gonna be important. This is a work in progress, but basically we saw it as you know three phases. The first is gathering information. You've already done some, some, some great communications. You've got an overarching communications plan. We don't wanna reinvent the wheel. So what's the information out there that we can use and capitalize on? What's the information that's kind of old and we want to make sure that, you know, we put that aside and know that that's old and not needed anymore. Um, then based on the information that we get during that collection stage, then we would form the foundational materials. What is our messaging? What are the, is the narrative that we're trying to explain to people? What are the visuals that we need to use? Because not everybody, you know, learns through that written material. What are the ways that we can really meaningfully get important information across? and then train our teams to make sure we're all on the same page about what that information is. And finally, in the third element, um, create the implement implementation plan. This is what we see quickly out of the chute, but what is the near and longer term plan to make sure that there are no gaps, that we're not taking our foot off the pedal, that people constantly are hearing about this and knowing what Sewerage and Water Board is doing so that they have confidence and if they don't have confidence that they know where to call in and hopefully get that confidence instilled. So um, I, I wouldn't wanna go into great detail on any one of these, though I'm happy to um, answer questions, but under the first, you see exactly what I was talking about. We, you know, we wanna get the right people at the table early on um, for an internal workshop, not only about lead and service line, but what are the peripheral or connected projects that are going on? What are the different ways that you're engaging the community? Because we, again, we talked about people on the other side of that pipe don't see all these different elements. So how are we gonna make sure we coordinate? What are the timelines that we need to meet? What's, what do we need to be looking around the corner for? Um, key stakeholder lists, just as Michelle was talking, is gonna be um, critical, making sure that we have um, those identified and that there are no gaps, that there's a plan to make sure everybody has information. One-on-one um, -on -one stakeholder discussions, I'm happy to answer questions about that, but that is a tool we believe is very important early on to use an approved set of a discussion guide to go out and talk to leaders in your community who I'm sure you could give me a list of 20 right now 
to talk about this issue, to maybe take some of that messaging and say, does this resonate? What do you think, you know, um, uh, your, 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 uh, the people in your jurisdiction or area are interested in hearing? And some of those stakeholders probably would be internal for an agency of your size as well, just kind of collecting information. Um, you've got community meetings already planned that have nothing to do with this, but why not use that as an opportunity to gather information if we can, ask some questions that we wanna ask about lens service and start to gauge <coughs> where your community is at. And then creating a framework. We call it a framework because as I said, a strategic communication plan, I've written them, they can be 60 pages and they can sit on a shelf and that's not helping anybody. What is the framework of our, our plan? What's the roadmap that's gonna get us through and how are we gonna to continue to look back at it and make sure it's achieving what we want. Um, you may, you've done some, some branding for your smart metering program. There's a reason for that. It's not just beautiful. It's because this is a long-term program. We want people to recognize when they see that, this is what we're talking about. This has to do with lead. It's important. It's educational. Please pay attention to this. So that may be something that you want to do. Um, and then all the informational materials and training. Um, and I, I introduced Terry before. Terry has done a lot of contractor training. This isn't just preparing your spokespersons for that media. This is who are the people that are gonna go out there, engage your community one-on-one, -on -one, and how can we best prepare them? And if it's a contractor, they are an extension of your agency. So let's make sure everybody is talking from the same um, talking sheet and has the informational materials. And finally, again, I know I'm talking rather quickly, but with that, those base informational materials, let's launch, let's go out there, let's start talking to people, starting with internally, let's meet with everybody that you say we should meet with in the sewage and water board and say, this is the program, this is what we're doing, this is why it's important, here's your part and how important that is, and here's the materials available to you. And by the way, if you have questions, we really wanna know that because we want you to understand this as well. Um, Question. I, I just quickly, I, I hadn't heard anybody say beneficial to the, to, but there's this is huge benefit and it's a sales job. So not just why it's important, but why it's beneficial to you. Because if it's going to be an inconvenience, it's mm -hmm. worth it. You, you all know better than I do, right? Exactly. And I'm really glad you raised that because that goes into kind of the messaging that we were talking about. And, and I probably didn't um, focus on it enough in terms of that strategic communication framework. Mm -hmm. That's a basis of it. We always go into these things thinking, oh my gosh, what are the things that we're worried about? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, this is a, an amazing benefit to your community. Yeah. It, has, it has public health ramifications that are large. You are ahead of the game Don't getting the this out there. Yeah. Yeah. Billing too. Yeah. But that's not, you know. I, I do understand the billing. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, it's always there. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, we keep talking about the lead, which I guess is what you've been engaged for but there's this well big actually yeah and that's a good point after you're finished can you give us a context of what is the purpose of your work and exactly yeah. what are the you know what's what the actual outcome they're looking to obtain from this because the sales program to me that has to occur is the ami yeah first of all because we've not done that we've not gone through this process that you're talking about for lead and if we just go talk about lead it's an no matter what, it's a negative message, but there's this whole education program at a much higher level. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing that out because somehow it seems to me that is an equally important part of this whole thing. So it goes back to your question of what's, what is the scope, scope and do we have the right scope, I guess is really the question. Yeah, and just to add to, well, yeah, the, the question of what's the scope, I think it's important to give us all context of what's being presented and also to just piggyback on your comment. There are multiple items that are going to come up in this community engagement that are, are equally important for us to communicate and, for lack of better terms, sell to the community. I think the, the quicker answer, and I would turn to um, Grace, too, to, to add on to this, um, is that we're, they're, they're refining the scope and your input today was really important on this because we do understand the interconnectivity. Um, the, the lead and copper line, uh, lead and copper rule requirements um, have some deadlines next year, but some of those new requirements also um, 
come into play as you're doing your smart metering program because we're doing work on lines and we're installing meters. And therefore, um, as I understand it, our scope is to make sure we are prepared for those <coughs> letter proper rule compliance and the notification requirements with the understanding that there's no way you can do that in a vacuum. You've got these really important um, smart metering programs. And again, I say there might be other things. That's why you have to have all the people at the table to make sure the things that we're doing out in the field and are coordinating those. So, um, but Grace, you could- So yeah. what, what, well, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm picking up from my colleagues are saying what I'm hearing, and I, I apologize for stuff out at the beginning, so you might have said this part, but I don't want there to ever be a feeling there's a bait and switch. We cannot make them think we're talking about item A and we're actually going to end up impacting them with item B. Um, whether item B is good, bad, indifferent, that, that can't be a feeling. And so part of what's a little confusing to me is how we're going to accomplish making sure we understand lead and copper, make sure we're going to accomplish getting the smart meter program done. Mm -hmm. You all's primary focus seems to be from lead and copper, but it can't be dissected away from smart meter. But I still don't want, I don't want anyone to come away feeling like they thought we were talking about A and we actually gave them B. And, and, you know, ordinarily you might be able to keep them totally separate, have the smart meters go in and then the lead service line inventory be done separately. However, in this case, the timing is a little bit together. So that gives both an opportunity and a challenge. And that's exactly your, all four of you are, you know, that's exactly what we've been talking about internally and the scope, you know, Jacobs is is engaged on the smart meter, but they also realize that there, this, there is going to be an interaction and we all have to be talking together. And in many ways, that first meeting, the strategic communications workshop is going to be the most important thing of anything that's on that page, because if we can get everybody, sewage and water board, in the same room talking about not just we know that there are those two projects and we don't want to have a bait and switch but there might be other projects that are going on at sewage and water board that could also impact opinion and thought on either one of those or both and what we want to do is have everything on the table so that we can put together a framework that says so that we can be clear and develop clear messaging because you're absolutely right if these things were approached separately mm -hmm. then there is going to be they're, they're going to jump, they're going to collide into each other and there's going to be a lot of miscommunication. If, however, we can start, because you are ahead of the game, this is, this is awesome. I mean, you don't have to, you wouldn't ordinarily have to do the lead copper line, uh, the, um, the uh, lead, co lead sewer service line inventory is not due until October 2024. However, you're starting your smart meters before that. This installation of a smart meter can trigger the need to provide a filter. And so that begins to raise question of the quality of the water. The great thing is we're sitting here well in advance. We can have those conversations here while everything's on paper and in the air and people aren't upset or concerned. And we can find those beneficial areas that we can, we can use as part of that messaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we certainly owe you all, um, you know, a look back at the framework for the smart metering. You know, as we did the same process, the listen, learning, engagement, we realized with those new regulations, um, you know, that speak about disturbing um, the the meter when you touch it, and we, you know, we have this opportunity now where we're touching every meter. This was a missing piece for that smart metering that we're excited to to put those puzzle pieces so together. We did have a team, a communication team that was going to be part of the smart meter replacement swapping. And we all trusted that that would have been a positive messaging, straightforward. With the new rule that came about in December of last year, requiring that we provide a picture during swapping of a meter, <clears throat> that added that layer of added communication to a very sensitive topic. The sequence obviously is somewhat backward, but we don't, we're not dictating that. Right. Because if we were remo removing and replacing the lead service lines before the swapping of the meters would have been a different messaging, different, right. different sequence. Mm -hmm. but so it's somewhat challenging in a way. And that's why we're focusing so much on the most sensitive message that will be coupled with the smart meter, which is very positive. But who's doing this major program for the AMI uh, itself? That's what I don't In partnership with Jacobs. So Jacobs is our- But what are they doing? I'm not hearing anything. But the, 
this is the very, probably the very first presentation as part of a bigger effort of how this team focusing on the lead, sort of the lead piece will be paired with the other team, communication team that also Jacob has, mm -hmm. that will, 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 will message together. Can we bring in the Jacob yes, team to absolutely. hear what they're doing? Because I, I don't, I'm not aware of anything in the community, you know, out, out there about this. And so the first thing I'm hearing is lead. Right. Which is, tells me there's a gap in the other program. The, from, a, from a timing and public communication, there isn't a gap yet. I mean, we have not communicated with anybody. We're, we're simply introducing the team that's going to add an, an integral and critical piece to the, re the rest of the team. Because, son, no, I'm, I'm talking about is we're starting to install meters this year, and, we, and I'm, the public's <clears throat> not hearing a co uh, there's no messaging program for the big program yeah. that I can tell. I mean, we certainly um, have the messaging in place. Uh, the, the rollout is a slow rollout. To your point, we are replacing meters as part of normal O&M. Um, and you know, once the smart meters um, are ready to, to roll out, we, we, we have the, the strategy. And sorry, Rebecca is here to, yeah. to speak. Okay. Well, yeah, well, yeah. And, and I just think that from a board perspective, it's difficult to provide feedback from a single piece mm -hmm. because this does, like you said, doesn't occur in a vacuum. So having knowledge and awareness of the broader piece will allow us to provide better feedback to this particular piece. Yes. Yeah. Just, <clears throat> just an ob observation. As a director's, um, I don't know, after we come to meetings, and so we need to be fully apprised of what's going on. Not that that's not what you all try and do, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, but but we are part of the front line communicating with the public, so whatever, and, and we need to fully understand the strategy and what's going on. Which, which it, includes getting that, some that's information. Not, that's not meant as a criticism, it's just yeah. meant as, as a positive thing. But used as a tool, we are a tool. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah why, don't you come, why don't you come to the table here? And get back to this one. Yeah. Okay. Rene, come on. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Becca Johnsey. Um, I know I've spoken with you before. I'm the program manager for our smart metering program. And the reason why you haven't seen active push out communication to the populace is because we're being extremely strategic in our timing. We don't want to say, hey, this great thing is coming a year in advance, or because the program's long, it could be two years before someone gets their meter, and then the messaging and content and understanding kind of gets lost in that time frame. So we're being very strategic about how that rollout comes out. So what we're doing right now is we're building an extremely extensive communications plan. We're making sure all of our communications are you know, very tight, very on point. We have the appropriate presentations for all of the different you know, education levels, all of the different stakeholders. And then we plan on starting that active outreach around June, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to start a very, very, very slow start. That's next month, for, right? Um, next the communications month. will start in June. We don't anticipate the meters going in the ground until a few months later. And so that gives us the ability to very specifically target that small populace that we're starting with and communicate with those folks first. And then we're going to roll out from there. So the majority of your residential customers will be near will be starting near the end of the year. That's when we start that installation process and that schedule. So we do have time to get this very, very comprehensive communications plan out to the public. So the reason why you haven't been brought in yet is we are we are working on that. And one of our last big risks that we had involved how we were going to deal with the lead and copper rule. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're bringing in CATS as an expert in this arena to help us with that messaging and to make sure that it makes sense and to make sure that we can hit those appropriate milestones so that we don't have impacts on our smart meter rollout. So worth repeating, the first tranche of the swapping meters do not have any lead issues because they are the larger meters. There's no lead in the, in the lines attached to them. So we do not have to message on that for, for a while. So it's not when you hear June, June is the, f the first time we're going to communicate, but the first time we, we need to communicate about lead and the swapping and the filtering will be much, much later. So we have not, we're, we're on track with the timing 
in terms of our strategy and messaging. That's I very think, crucial to I think to part of the issue that. is that we're just not aware of the, I don't think we're aware of the specific timing and having sort of the timeline and understanding Connor, when things are, too, yeah. right, what, when things are gonna happen so that we understand that then what you guys are talking about is a piece of this okay. and we're not gonna keep distracting by adding questions about the the bigger project, but that's kind of what we're looking for is, you know, where, how do these all fit together? Like what you said was just very helpful, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and we probably should have talked about that first. Janet. But one of the things that just strikes me in all this is this AMI is one of the best things that's ever happened around here. <laughs> it should be out there. I mean, it's not a question of just waiting until somebody comes along and you have to install the first mirror. This is a major, major opportunity for us to say, <clears throat> we're doing something that's going to address all the aggravations you've been talking about. Um, the, the billing problems, the meter reading problems. And to me, it's, it's if, we, if we're just waiting until we, we come do along it. and start <laughs> installing things, we're, we're missing a great PR opportunity. Okay. I'm no expert on that. I don't know when you should start doing it, but I agree. It's great news. Big best thing that's happened in 50 years, probably. I don't yeah. know. Um, but uh, I say this all the time. It's kind of a general, you cannot over communicate. So flood me anyway yeah. with information, whatever's available, because yeah. uh, I'll do my best to read it. They have, and, 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 have and, and we're not suggesting that. that we need to see the whole plan that you're working on. It's more understanding when things are happening and that, that plan is being worked on and we can expect to see it at a certain point of time and here's how we might be involved or here's the opportunity for us to offer input you know, along the way. So, so we're, not, we're not putting on the spot that like today you need to provide the plan, it's more we didn't understand the context. You know, I think the biggest risk to having smart readers be the best thing that's ever happened around here, the biggest risk is that we're gonna influence people's water lines that have led in them and the negativity, the potential negativity of that message could completely overshadow the benefit of installing smart meters, which yeah. is why we're bringing this team and their expertise to you today yeah. so yeah. we can incorporate it before we roll out the rest of the that's plan. That's fine. And that's why. That's I, why I, would, I would love to hear more from this team, and then we can come back okay. with what additional information do we want yeah. to get from the staff um, about sorry, the bigger picture. So okay, just because we have the opportunity of them right now. Okay. But I, I think that you guys can see just how this is, this is a, a friendly crowd. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. This is a friendly crowd um, that wants to see, wants to see the positive. Um, but I, I do think that for for me, I, I'm not an engineer. My dad is, and he's disappointed to this day. I'm not. Um, <laughs> he's only a doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's very rich. Like, mm. But I literally thought every single pipe that was disturbed would be a lead introduction problem. So it, I was today years old when I realized that we had meters we could switch that would not trigger a problem. Right. I, and, and so when you walk in thinking, oh, so I'm thinking we're going to have a problem in a month. Right. You know, and, and as a board member thinking we're going to have a problem in a month that we're not going to have in a month. Right. Um, layering on top of people that feel historically marginalized and left out. So somebody's going to have to go first. And I've said this a million times. Whoever goes first is going to be happy, and whoever goes last is going to be hair on fire pissed, mm -hmm. especially if it's as good as everybody says it is. Right. And, it, and it, they might be last because they were the furthest down the line. They might be last because of a thousand different reasons. But anytime you're last, especially for something great, you feel like you were last because you were stepped over. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think that is as important a problem as anything. So I, I just, I, th this is just this. Something about this doesn't feel, it feels dissonant to me. This, and, I, and I can't lay my hands on what it is. This doesn't, this feels dissonant. I think it's, it's the disconnect that we have from like the broader vision. I insist yeah. on that. And I 100% agree. I mean, you hear lead and it's scary. And, oh. you know, and if it's going to come up with a broader project, 100%, we need to be having this conversation to be able to address it before it comes and explodes in our face. Because we all know the question of lead, it's not, I mean, it's already surfaced. Maybe not to the point of how we expect it will come out when we have the, the meter installation. But anyways, that's just to wrap up what I've been mentioning. I think it, it is a disconnect. We need the context, broader context, understand the broader picture, and absolutely be prepared for, you know, the who's questions. Who's first yeah. and who's last? 
because we don't just need to communicate to the people that are first like that. I just no, look. Nobody wants to be last in line for something good. I guess no. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> no, that, thank you. It's exactly this is well, exactly part of our learning. And, and to be honest, those are the questions that we have for the you know the initial kick workshop meetings as well. What are all those things that have the potential to impact the engagement? How do they work together? So you really are telling that whole story that you really do understand that whole context and some of the technical questions that you've just mentioned about order of installation or how this is actually going to be launched in the field are, are all ones that we have those same questions. But at the end of the day, I think you started with, I wouldn't want somebody, a bait and switch or somebody mm -hmm. to think we're talking about this. That is the absolute last thing mm -hmm. that, that we would want. And that's why kind of that learning and listening early on, there's there's more to be learned. And, and I, I certainly understand that has implications to other right. activities as well. Can, can I emphasize one thing here? There's mm -hmm. two positive things that we're doing here. Not only we're swapping the old meters with smart meters, we're also doing the right thing voluntarily because Becca Johnsy, the lead project, is committed to do it, doing the ethical thing, not just because of the requirement. We're doing it in advance to protect our consumer. I mean, that's the message, mm -hmm. right? Unfortunately, because it's the topic is sensitive and there's history with Flint and others, we want to make sure that we're delivering a very positive, understandable message, and that's what we're trying to do. So ultimately, what we owe you is the big, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> how everything large. jives to me, yeah. and then some of the logistics and some of the facts about lead. Why they, if it's a larger size, it's not lead because. It just doesn't exist. It's, and where it's is limited. It? And where, and where I, is it? Right. You know, it's not like people, like regular people, do right. not know this. Like they just don't. And and it, and if you say stuff like, "We're going to start with the businesses because they're easier," I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. If we say we're going to start with the businesses because they're easier, they have the biggest lines, the least list for uh, least risk for lead. What people are going to hear is you're doing everything for those tourists, mm -hmm. and screw the people that actually live here. I promise you, that's what they're going to hear. Mm -hmm. Like, and and it's just. Because that's what happens. Exactly. <laughs> right. Well, right. you hear lead, and then you think it's the entire city. So exactly. also, you know, we that's... have to marry the message of we are in the middle of the inventory process. Right. Yeah. You know, satisfying the lead and copper rule, which is due in October of 20, next year. So we're on track to delivering not only an inventory mm -hmm. of what we have, because we don't know where they are, and if we don't know what it is, it has to be assumed that it is lead to protect the consumer, we also need to produce a plan of how do we replace all the lead service lines. So there's a lot happening. And the sequence, you know, like I said, it's not exactly how I would draw it up just because of, yeah. you know, the mm -hmm. rules come out of. Can and I ask just you guys so, a question? So you're hearing this conversation and sort of what our concerns are, how we brought some more people into the, into the discussion. Where have you all solved a, a situation like this before? And can you walk us through what happened how you caught it before everybody's hair got on fire, and 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 and, and that and, and that because this is this is a real sensitive thing. And the potential fire is because I can totally see having a, a community meeting, the media catching it, hearing it lead, goes, and then it just goes out of you know out of control. Like there's lead in New Orleans. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of the the best example, but normally when we're involved, there's usually some sort of um, whether it's water quality or somehow I'm impacting a property or I perceive that there's a risk even if there there isn't so a lot of the projects have that um, oh they, they, they've already had the, 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 the situation happen when they call like it. Flint yeah. <laughs> like they've already had the Flint well, <laughs> I mean yes we've worked on projects um, not the size of New Orleans but um, discolored water projects that um, this day and age if you're doing flushing and somebody starts to get discolored water, they will immediately assume that that's lead, even if there are no lead service lines. So in that case, it's been reactionary and trying to create that messaging at that time to say, here's what's, here's what's going on in the system, here's what's we're, what we're doing, here's the kind of risk communication, providing the information. Some people only want that top level information. Others who have more technical backgrounds want the details. So, so laying that out. Now, again, that's reactionary. You all are ahead of it. Um, 
and we try to be ahead of it. In Waukesha, Wisconsin, right now, we're working on a project where they are changing from groundwater to um, Lake Michigan water. Um, that is a great thing. It is a wonderful thing for them, and Lake Michigan water is great, but when you start putting a different kind of water through the pipes, it can tend to have some issues for people, as well as um, uh, Milwaukee uses chloramines, uh, what Waukesha uses chlorine. I don't know if that's an issue you've had here, but there is a, is a sector out there that's very much against chloramine. So when they hear about chloramine water coming in, so that's been on the forefront of, um, we're not changing out pipes or anything. They have no lead service lines up there. We're still having to talk about lead, but we're, talk we're, we're busy working proactively to talk about, here's what we're doing. Here's the importance of it. Here's what it costs, because everybody wants to know that as well. Here's some things that you can do. You're going to see some aesthetic differences in, the, you know, for a temporary amount of time. And um, and here's the timeline, just as you said, for this to be com completed. Now, um, you know, I know there's a host of other projects that, that come into play with exactly the kinds of issues that you've talked about. And um, just at the moment, none's coming straight to mind. But um, proactive, like you're talking about, I think exactly what we've said, understand what, what the world is that we're working within right now. What are the projects? What are the issues? Who are those stakeholders? What are those kind of issues going to be? Or whether it's perception or reality, if somebody, you know, believes that they're being misfairly treated because our technical program says we ought to start here instead of here, then we need to think about that and either change the program or explain why it is this way in a way that people can understand and it makes sense to them. So all that kind of early questioning. Makes a huge difference. And um, this is not related to utility, but with the Port of New Orleans, we had a project where we were, were investing in a, they have retired. They, they're investing in a $2 billion uh, project downriver to build a new terminal. Well, it's being built right in right adjacent to the community of Violet, which is an underserved community that's been underserved forever. And um, and so what we did with that was we went straight to the people in that neighborhood, and we got to know them, and we heard them, and we listened to them, and there was a lot of fear because you know it, this what's what had been a a um, empty field, you know, seemingly empty field was. We had we bought, and so we bought a majority of the eighty percent or something of the land in that violet community for this for use of this terminal and other uses. And by going in early and listening, we learned that there were certain things that were really sacred to them. One was a cemetery that they had been trying to get expanded for years. And so what we did was we designed around that cemetery in listening to very con contentious community meetings. We heard that they were concerned that we were going to cut off the parish, half of the parish, by the way we wanted to route the road. Well, we worked for months trying to figure out could we reroute the road. Our public position the entire time was we have to, we have to have this road go around the terminal, and we can't go, we can't keep the road straight as it is right now. Um, but all the while, we were working internally to see can we do it, can we do it, and thank God um, because it was a huge win. Um, we were able to to do it. So start it. We were able to keep the road straight and not cut off the parish. So we did this against the backdrop of some residents who were who organized a group called Save Our Saint Bernard, and they were actively trying to um, get us to forget about the project. And when I talked about partnering and building allies, we continued to work with the. St. Bernard Parish, the, the elected officials who were very skittish and they knew that it could turn into a, a, um, an elected an election issue. But what we really always kept in mind was the people in Violet. They are the ones who are going to either get the jobs or not get the jobs. They're going to, you know, their, their homes were going to be disturbed and so, or, you know, their community was being disturbed and because of the building of this um, project. And we were able to um, have their support. We worked to get their support, and the way we did it was by talking in very practical terms about, in, in their case, it was working with Fast Start and LED to make sure that the training, when this thing is built, there's going to be training for people in Violet, and so that the jobs, there will be people that will be ready to work in Violet. They, they can't, you can't 
say we're only going to hire people in violet, but if the people in violet are trained and they're right next to the terminal, that gives them an advantage. I don't know what the equivalent is here, but there is one. There's it. It, it really it's messy. It's hard, and before you get to the benefits and people understanding the benefits, you have to open yourself up to hearing what people are afraid of. And it is, you know, you don't want the great smart meter initiative to be hijacked by lead, but that's happening anyway. It's going to either happen now or it's going to happen next October. Mm -hmm. So how do we make sure that we are listening? And, you know, and from there we can explain, here's why you're first, here's why you're last, but have people from the beginning be part of the conversation. And maybe things are changing based on what they say. Maybe they want to be last. Or, you know, they, they being whoever, yeah. um, you know, any of the stakeholders. Um, this is a question for Gassan because I've kind of lost track of, of something. The lead probe, the lead pipes are not our pipes. Is that correct? That they are, Pete, they are the connecting pipes on property. The, that's partly true. Partly the, true. the lead service line goes from the main all the way to the property. And typically half or part of that is ours as okay. the utility up to the meter or the lot line. Okay. And the remaining piece is typically the same material but is owned by the property. Okay. So. And so what is, I mean, I know that because, because of these rules, we have to take action even if, if we don't know what it is. Do we know what the scope of the real... Lead problem is in the. During, uh, yeah, I had that same question. Where are those pipes? The magnitude, you mean? Well, yeah. I mean, it's Location. premature to talk about exact numbers, but it's going to be massive undertaking, which is similar to many cities our size. Okay. Milwaukee had seventy six thousand of them. Okay. Right. So, um, and then you you just have to have a a definitive plan of what what you're doing to replace them mm -hmm. and. We anticipate the rules will come down that would they, we're going to be given a deadline. It's not going to be like thousand a, a year, so you have seven years to get rid of your deadline. It may be much much shorter. Hopefully, with <coughs> some funded mandate like that. But is it funded or is it unfunded? It, so far, there's some money that came through the IJA dollars that would, okay. are earmarked for or designated for lead service line replacements. There's some complications with that. Um, because it, if you are to use that money, you have to re put that replace the entire lead service line all the way, to, which is the right thing to yeah. do, and we're 100% yeah. supportive. But that means we're spending uh, utility dollars on right. private right. piece. So we'll, ha we'll have to, in the interest of, of public safety, we'll maybe able to do that. Uh -huh. So we just now have to come up with that plan, which is due of October of next year. I'm coming and, up. Sorry. Yeah, from an operations perspective, is there already an operations plan that has pipes identified and knows, you know, how you're going to deploy that? So back to my question, do we know, well, you answer, you don't know how many, but do, do we have a sense of where they are? And is there going to be an operations plan that ultimately will have to be tied up to a PR strategy? Yes. So, so ultimately, we will have to produce a plan based on the inventory that we, we develop of what we what we plan to do as a city as a utility to get rid of all, all of the uh, lead service lines, there are uh, probably heat maps, so to speak, where it's there's high concentration in some neighborhoods, less of, of them in others, based on the the age of the, the you know the neighborhoods and what have you. So that will all be worked out. Currently, if we encounter one, we would by policy we replace it. We replace ours, all our JRR project, for example, that in, involves replacing a water main, is replace, involves replacing mm -hmm. all the way to the meter. So we're leaving behind potentially a lead service line from the meter to, which has to be replaced as well. So it's very complicated. It's going to be of a large magnitude, but we're not alone. And then as long as we have a plan and we're steadily behind it and funding it, you know, we're doing it the right way. Am I right in understanding that there are two, one, there's the federal mandate that's to replace the lead pipes, <clears throat> which is in, totally independent. Uh, I mean, that would have to occur regardless of AMI. Correct. And then the AMI intersection comes because we are 
disturbing. Disturbing. Yeah. Disturbing. Disturb yeah. Okay, and so once that happens, at that point, we are replacing the, the pipes? Line. No. No, we are no. just re we're so just... So by definition, anytime you disrupt the lead service line, you have to provide protection to the consumer okay. for up to six months. And that's based on research, which shows that the level of lead in the water spikes okay. when you have a, a significant disruption of that line, okay? And the, the swapping of the meter, by definition, falls within that okay. the, the significant disruption. So that's why we are required, or will be required, in October 2024, but we are choosing to do it right away, is to provide that filter that has a six months carriage that would filter the water and protect the consumer from lead and the spiking of it. And it goes on the water line? It, no, it's a, just a fill, it's a pitcher. I'm sorry, it's a pitcher that you fill, fill up. Refrigerator. And you put it in the refrigerator and you, it's, it's what you use to drink or cook. So, and that's an acceptable sample. Remember the little uh, the, um, pitcher thing that they had branded, they showed us a little bit back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just want to point out that in addition to us being a friendly crowd, we're an informed crowd and we don't know this stuff. So, I mean, it just, it's a signal that I don't know if, if you guys are thinking about like visuals because we can't go through that, yeah. <laughs> you know, explanation yeah. every time. And so what's the picture? What's the infographic? Right. Right. Or, exactly. I mean, I'm assuming that is a tool that you've used in the past because, and we're going to need our own talking points and, you know, potentially training and, and it's and also stuff like if I may just add as part of the education that we're going to do is that <clears throat> we don't create any lead in the water obviously the only source of lead is the leaching the lead from that lead service line into the water but people but we take we, we take mm -hmm. precaution and we take measures for for corro uh, corrosion control and we line we end up with the chemical that we introduce mm -hmm. in the water that lines that service line that kind of creates a barrier and does not allow the leaching. We do testing. We are well within the, the allowed parameters of, of lead and water. It's that disruption and this disturbance, I should say. That's the and, word, and disturbance. That's key messaging. Yes. Because, yes. You that know, will again, all come together as, yeah. as, as that have to be repeated many, many times before it resonates and it be understood. And whoever is at risk, you know, that they clearly understand from a health perspective what actions they can take proactively to, you know, yeah. protect their health. Absolutely. So do you have, uh, I know we, we got you away from this, but what, what were the no, other that was, sort we, of major? No, this actually was okay. the, um, okay. no, the, the was last slide, and this was very helpful, because you're right, that's exactly the questions that are going to come up. Um, I've been thinking about, and I was thinking about Jenna Begna, who, yeah, I think like because of COVID, she became a very credible spokesperson in the community, and people recognize her, and, and so on and so forth, but I'm I'm very curious who else as individuals, um, and I'm not talking about people necessarily work for the city, but just in general, I mean, there are a lot of stakeholders out there, but that doesn't mean they're all the best champion. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just wanna, um, I'm, I'm involved in sort of the coastal restoration side of water as well, and um, I recently saw a public perception poll about what people in Louisiana think about coastal restoration, or are they for, you know, major coastal restoration projects and such. And they they took the time to identify who are the, the trusted spokespeople. So it's not always what you think, right? And so it turns out that people will believe fishermen over the over scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was an amazing yeah. kind of piece of information that <laughs> in terms of like thinking about spokespeople. And I'm just wondering how 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 you're going to get to that point where because because i think like what you uncover is going to be helpful to us forever <laughs> not just for this project yeah, right but right. who are our champions who people really will trust and believe i guess i would start where we started before which is every community is different yeah. so and those those one-on-one -on -one discussions we talked about helps with that a lot that's one of the questions who do you think, who do you go to for your information? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that starts to feed it. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's not the overall answer. But I would also say there is good research out there. We, we are um, actually part of a team that's, it's, the report's not finished yet, but it's on microplastics and water, because that's a really mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. difficult circumstance to talk about because we don't know. 
Um, and one of the questions was a statistically valid survey. So they have the data on it and I, I can try to uncover that for you all. But um, um, it, doctors first, um, academ uh, academicians, um, those, you know, kind of um, pr professors who are studying these certain areas. Um, then it gets to faith-based um, leaders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the water utility, sadly, you know, <laughs> midway down. But actually, that particular survey showed how much people really do trust their water provider mm -hmm. um, to, to provide high-quality water. So you weren't, you know, it was not the bottom of the list. Um, but I can provide that, but we do, we at least have that kind of information. And then we would want to find out if that is actually true here. I'm not saying we have to do a statistically valid survey, right. but we, there's some means to, right. to find that out. So I want to do a time check because um, Janet and Maurice, I just, I don't know. There's a, there's a hair on fire, Dave, so. A hair on fire. <laughs> We're running towards the end. <laughs> okay, so, so should we be wrapping up this? I mean, this concludes the presentation item, right? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. One um, thought I had just, um, so, and you may be already aware, um, obviously you're spending time with Grace, but also we went through a whole process to develop our first ever strategic plan, which Tyler Antrup led. And so we have a, a, a start with stakeholder list, probably from that, from the, and, and you can sort of understand from him how we gathered information for that, which may not be exactly the same way you're doing it, but just, you know, that will be familiar to some people out there that we kind of went out and did this sort of discovery um, for the strategic wonderful. plan. And so this could be sort of messaged as the, the next thing and, and that kind of thing. That would be very helpful. Again, we, we don't want to re reinvent the wheel that you've done a lot let's maximize that and then and then build from there so that'd be great thank okay. thank you for having us and we thank really you. do appreciate thank all the questions really really informative thank you, thank you. okay so um until people start really leaving <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear about the legislative um Absolutely. If you guys, okay. I brought a, okay. just a hard copy, and we can fly through this as quickly as you guys would like to. Oh, yeah. Um, but I think it is important. I think I passed that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone need one? Grace? Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go through and read this, so you can read it at your leisure, but the highlights are this. We're about halfway through the 2023 legislative session. Um, a, a significant change this session as compared to previous is that the board encouraged us to go out and seek some additional help, and we did so. Um, so we have brought on on a short-term basis um, Jones Walker firm, that's Richard Cortezas here in New Orleans, and Logan Anderson in Baton Rouge, as well as Pelican State Partners, and that's Sue at at Pathy. Um, all three of them have decades of experience. Um, sure. Yeah. Right yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I miss her. Uh, her in the business like to, to yes. help, right? That inherently um, makes me feel better. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, they are helping us. We're in touch with them almost daily, and they have been critical in terms of communicating with all of our um, partners at the state level, <laughs> communicating with us, and um, kind of um, recruiting some additional regional partners and stakeholders to reach out to some um, legislators from adjoining parishes and other folks who might not typically be supporters of ours in terms of our capital outlay ask, which is our which is our priority ask this year. So I know we shared, Gassan shared with the board initially that um, when the state's HB2 bill came out that our capital outlay request was not included. Um, I think we were not alone in that vote. I think that there were some surprises in the bill. So the strategy has been to um, work individually with our legislative delegation, all of whom are already supporters of it, but beyond that, to amend the bill to include our request. Um, we don't have specifics that I can share at this point in time, but that bill is going to its first House committee meeting um, this week, tomorrow, actually. So, Where's it, where it going? Ways and means. Right? Uh, yes, yes, ways and means. That's exactly right. Um, and of course, our lobbyists will be there on that and other people who might strategically I'll also support. I'll be there support. tomorrow. And so maybe perhaps we will me. call on you <laughs> to support us on that. Um, and so that we will continue to keep you apprised of that, although um, I think we're feeling cautiously optimistic that some progress will be made there. 
Um, there has been some other notable legislation. There's a chart on the second page of the handout um, that kind of runs through the bills primarily that could or will impact us. I think the, probably the one to focus on for, in terms of this conversation is Representative Hilferty's bill, which we shared with you via email earlier. Um, the purpose of the bill was to expand this agency's authority to waive customer debt, which we do have um, some concerns about, particularly from a legal perspective. However, the legislation itself is permissive, not mandatory. So in other words, it does not, it's, it's non-compulsory. We do not have to change our policies as a result of this legislation. So uh, due to that nature of it and kind of the broader political context right now, we are not opposing that bill. Um, we are following it closely. We're also following some other bills that are moving through the process uh, where amendments have been made so that they do not impact us directly, um, that otherwise would have had an um, not purposeful impact on us, but <laughs> encompassed us as accidentally as part of their scope. Um, and so we've successfully kind of avoided any negative impacts on those and we'll continue to watch them and let you know if anything uh, pops up that is concerning. And after the session is over, which will be about another four weeks, we will ask our team to come in and give you guys an overview that would be great. Um, of the entirety of the session and let you know how it went and get your feedback on if there are better things we could do next time around. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. That's really Kristen. great. I'm, I really appreciate that. And that makes the teacher made everything feel much better. better. Yeah. <laughs> he made his day. But, um, oh, oh, God. <laughs> Um, all right, so are there any uh, public comments? No public comments here. Okay, well then um, I think I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Okay, moved and second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. Aye.